morning, and welcome to biology. I'm Paul Suchecki, and this is my classroom. It's great to see all your smiling faces this morning. All right, this is biology. Biology is the study of living things. Living things are amazing. There are living things all around you. Everything from plants and animals and fungi and bacteria, protists. Everywhere you go, there are living things. There's an incredible variety of living things. And yet, with all of this diversity, all living things share certain characteristics. That's one of the reasons I find biology so interesting. In biology, there's just way too much to learn. One person in a lifetime couldn't study all the different kinds of living things. So where should we start? An organism is a complete living thing. A dog is an organism. A tree is an organism. A squirrel, a mushroom, a bacteria. You are an organism because you're a complete living thing. My thumb is a living thing, but it's not a complete living thing. You see, it's not an organism. I guess the true test would be, could I cut off my thumb and set it free? And could it live on its own? Of course not. You can't cut off your thumb and set it free. It's not a complete living thing. It's not an organism. Your thumb is an organ. A species is a type of living thing. Is it species or species? Or how about species? Anyways, a better definition of a species is a group of similar organisms that can interbreed and form fertile offspring. A species is a type of living thing, like a cat or a dog. A cat and a dog are not the same species. Of course, a cat and a dog could never interbreed to form any kind of offspring. I mean, what would you get? A cat dog? I think that's been done. A cardinal and a robin are both birds, but are they the same species? Could a robin and a cardinal interbreed to make fertile offspring? No, a robin and a cardinal are not the same species. You see, cardinals mate with cardinals and have little baby cardinals. And robins mate with robins and have little baby robins. Cardinals and robins don't get together and have babies. What would you get, a rardinal or a cobbin? A raccoon and a possum could never interbreed with each other because they're not the same species. <laughs> How about a black snake and a green snake? They're not the same species. How about trees? You know, a sugar maple and a silver maple are not the same thing. There's lots of species of oaks. There's red oak and black oak, white oak. How about dogs? Is a Labrador and a German Shepherd the same species? Yeah, a Labrador and a German Shepherd are the same species because they could interbreed with each other and form fertile offspring. You get a mutt. A horse and a donkey can interbreed with each other, but they form a mule. And a mule's not fertile. So for that reason, a horse and a donkey are not the same species. Close. You know, the truth of the matter is that nature doesn't always follow our definition of a species. A wolf and a coyote are considered two different species. However, it's been reported in Toronto, Canada, a group of wolves and coyotes have mated with each other and have formed fertile offspring. They call them koi wolves. And now there's a breeding population of koi wolves in Toronto. Apparently, they didn't get the memo. So how many different species are there? Nobody really knows for sure, because not all the species have been discovered. Scientists find new species all the time. Scientists estimate that there could be as many as 40 million different species of living things on Earth. We've identified about 2 million. So if you think about it, that leaves about 38 million species of living things out there yet to be discovered. You know, for me, one of the frustrating things about being a modern human is it seems like all the cool stuff has already been discovered. But really, there's a whole world out there with 38 million species waiting to be discovered. I just hope we get to them all before they go extinct. Or maybe we should just leave them alone. There are some scientists whose job it is to explore the world looking for new species. I think that would be a cool job. <laughs> Where do I sign up? Tell you they got a lot of work to do. Like I said, one person in 10 lifetimes couldn't study all the different species of living things. So to make our job a little bit easier as biologists, we take all the living things and we put them in groups according to their characteristics, and then we study the groups. We call these groups kingdoms, and depending on who you talk to, there could be as many as two or 23 different kingdoms of living things. There's more than one way to classify living things. Most scientists accept a six kingdom system. Can you name the six kingdoms of living things? Everybody knows the animal kingdom. Animals are everywhere. Plant kingdom, that one's easy too. See plants everywhere. How about the fungi kingdom? You know, mushrooms, mold, things like that. The other three kingdoms are less obvious because they're microscopic. 
You need a microscope to see them. There's the protist kingdom, things like the amoeba, the paramecium, euglena, one-celled organisms that you find in a pond. The kingdom eubacteria includes all the true bacteria. Bacteria are smaller than protists and can live just about anywhere on Earth. Most people think all bacteria are harmful and bad, but the truth is most bacteria are good. There's a few that are bad. I guess bacteria are a lot like teenagers, you know. Did you know there's bacteria living in your intestines right now that you can't live without? But that's a lesson for another day. So what about the sixth kingdom? The kingdom Archaebacteria, or once part of the kingdom Monera with all of the other bacteria. But microbiologists, scientists who specialize in bacteria, have decided that the Archaebacteria are so different from normal eubacteria that they really deserve their own separate kingdom. And so they created a sixth kingdom. It's just a more accurate way to group things. The Archaebacteria thrive in some pretty extreme environments, like hot pools at 200 degrees Fahrenheit where nothing else could live, or in an acid lake at about pH 2. So what about viruses? What kingdom do viruses belong in? Well, most scientists think that viruses aren't really living things. They don't have all of the characteristics of living things, so they're not classified into a kingdom like living things. But I guess you'd have to talk to a virologist about that one. The animal kingdom is divided into two major groups, the vertebrates and the invertebrates. Vertebrate animals have a backbone, invertebrate animals don't have a backbone. Fish are the largest group of vertebrate animals. That makes sense, three-fourths of the planet's covered in water. Amphibians are animals like frogs and toads, salamanders and newts. Reptiles are lizards and snakes, turtles and tortoises, alligators and crocodiles. Don't forget our fine feathered friends, the birds. Not all birds fly, but they all have feathers and they all lay eggs. What about our furry friends, the mammals? Mammals have hair, they produce milk, and most of them give birth to live young. Animals that don't have backbones are called invertebrates. The simplest animals are the sponges in the phylum Periphera. The phylum Cnidaria includes some lovely species of jellyfish and coral, but don't be fooled, they all sting. There are three phyla of worms, the flatworms, the round worms, and the segmented worms. The phylum mollusca includes clams and oysters, snails and slugs, octopuses and squids. A spiny group of animals called the phylum echinodermata includes all of the starfish and sea urchins. As a matter of fact, echinodermata means spiny skin. The largest group of animals by far is the phylum arthropoda, or do you say arthropoda? Is it Arthropoda or Arthropoda? Anyways, there's more species of arthropods than all other species combined. One of my least favorite are the arachnids, spiders and scorpions and ticks. But my wife, she loves spiders. I like the crustaceans, lobsters, crayfish, crabs. Mm. What about the myriapods, like centipedes and millipedes? But it's the insects that really make this group the largest group. There are more insects than any other group of animals. The plant kingdom is also divided into two major groups, the bryophytes and the tracheophytes. The bryophytes, like mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, lack vascular tissue, and so they don't grow very tall. They survive best in moist, shady environments. The tracheophytes have vascular tissue, then grow a lot taller. Most of the plants that you're familiar with are tracheophytes. Tracheophytes are things like ferns, cycads, and all of the flowering plants. Most of the plants are flowering plants. Everything from grass and trees and all the little tiny plants that grow in the forest. There are way too many species and not enough time for one biologist to study all of them. So most biologists specialize in one group of species or another. A biologist who specializes in just animals is called a zoologist. Zoology is the study of animals. A biologist who specializes in just plants is called a botanist. Botany is the study of plants. A biologist who specializes in mushrooms and mold and fungi is called a mycologist. Mycology is the study of fungi. A biologist that studies bacteria is called a microbiologist. A microbiologist is not a really, really small biologist. Microbiology is the study of really, really small living things.
One of the things that fascinates me as a biologist is all of the diversity and variety of living things. We share the planet with some pretty amazing living things. Even though there's so many different kinds of living things, all living things have certain characteristics in common. A bumblebee has certain characteristics in common with a daylily. A redwood tree has characteristics in common with a whale. You have certain characteristics in common with a mushroom. First of all, all living things are made of one or more cells. The cell is the basic unit of life. A living thing made of just one cell is called unicellular. Most bacteria and protists are unicellular. A living thing made of many cells is called multicellular. You are multicellular. As a matter of fact, you're made of trillions of cells. All animals, all plants, and most fungi are multicellular. In a true multicellular organism, there's division of labor, or cell specialization. What I mean is, in a true multicellular organism, there are many different cell types, and each cell type has its own job to do. For example, in your body, there are heart cells and kidney cells and bone cells and skin cells and eyeball cells and big toe cells and they all have different jobs and as long as each cell type is doing its job then the whole organism stays alive and healthy there are some organisms that are made of more than one cell but there's no cell specialization all of the cells are the same it's like a colony for example in the kingdom protista there's a little organism called a volvox a volvox is a colony of cells. In the colony, all the cells are the same. There's no division of labor. There's no cell specialization. So it's not really a true multicellular organism. We call it a colonial organism. Second, all living things are organized. Now you might not be organized, but as an organism, you're organized. What I mean is, subatomic particles like protons, neutrons, and electrons make up atoms. Atoms make up molecules. Molecules make up macromolecules. Macromolecules make up organelles. Organelles make up cells. Cells make up tissues. Tissues make up organs. Organs make up organ systems. And organ systems make up the whole organism. Oh! See? An organism is organized. So what are subatomic particles made of? Now, since some organisms are unicellular, we can stop at the cell, and that's the organism. In other words, bacteria has no organs, it has no tissues, it has no organ systems. The cell is the organism. Third, all living things need energy. Living things need energy to keep their metabolism going. There are thousands of chemical reactions going on in every cell in your body right now. All of those chemical reactions together are known as metabolism. Metabolism requires an input of energy, and you get that energy from the foods you eat. Some people define life as nothing more than a long series of complex chemical reactions. This long series of complex chemical reactions is called metabolism. A plant is an autotrophic organism. A plant can make its own food by photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, plants take in carbon dioxide through their leaves and they take in water through their roots. With the help of sunlight and chlorophyll, they produce glucose and oxygen. The glucose is their food. They release the oxygen into the air and that becomes part of the 21% of the oxygen that we breathe. Some people think, and I agree, that photosynthesis is the most important chemical reaction on Earth. All of our food and all of our breathable oxygen come from photosynthesis. Plants aren't the only organisms that can do photosynthesis. There are some bacteria and some protists that can do photosynthesis. And surprisingly, not all plants do photosynthesis. There are some parasitic plants, like dodder, that lack chlorophyll. They tap into the vascular tissue of a host plant and steal their glucose. Animals and fungi lack chlorophyll and can't do photosynthesis. Any organism that can't do photosynthesis and must consume food is called a heterotrophic organism. In addition to animals and fungi, many bacteria and protists are heterotrophic too. Whether an organism does photosynthesis or must consume food, the energy that's in the glucose is released during a process called cellular respiration. And this is the energy that drives your metabolism. Cellular respiration occurs when glucose is broken down with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Heterotrophic organisms do cellular respiration, but they can't do photosynthesis. Autotrophic organisms like plants 
do photosynthesis and respiration. So what about a Venus flytrap? Is it autotrophic or heterotrophic? In fact, a plant like a Venus flytrap has chlorophyll. It does photosynthesis and can make its own glucose. But like other insect-eating plants, it eats the insects mostly for the nitrogen. Fourth, all living things grow. That means they get bigger. Organisms get bigger two ways. One, by cell enlargement. Two, by cell division. Cells take in water and nutrients. These substances become part of the cell. This makes the cell get bigger. If all the cells in an organism get bigger, then the whole organism gets bigger. Cell division is when your cells produce more cells. If an organism has more cells, it's gonna be bigger. You grow both ways, by cell division and by cell enlargement. For example, mature muscle cells don't divide. So in a full-grown human, when the muscle gets bigger, it's simply because each muscle cell gets bigger. However, when the muscle gets bigger, the skin around it also has to get bigger. Skin grows by cell division. Five, living things have the ability to reproduce. To reproduce means to make more of one's own kind. Cats have kittens, dogs have puppies. It would be weird if a cat gave birth to a litter of puppies. And it would be weird if a dog gave birth to a litter of kittens. Each species makes more of its own kind. Notice I didn't say all living things must reproduce in order to survive. It's not essential that each living organism has to reproduce. The species has to reproduce. What do you suppose would happen if a species couldn't reproduce? Wouldn't be long before that species went extinct. There are two ways that organisms reproduce. One way is called asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction is when an offspring is the result of one parent. The good thing about asexual reproduction is that it's very fast. A unicellular organism like a bacteria can divide and divide and divide and in a matter of hours produce millions of its own kind. The problem with asexual reproduction is that the offspring are genetically identical to the parent. It's kind of like cloning. There's no genetic diversity. And in nature, that's not good. If all the members of a population are genetically the same, and there's a change in the environment that could kill one of them, it could probably wipe out the entire population. Bacteria and protists are very good at asexual reproduction. Some fungi and plants can do asexual reproduction. There are some invertebrate animals that can reproduce asexually, but asexual reproduction is extremely rare in more advanced animals like vertebrates. And of course, humans can't reproduce asexually. Wouldn't that be cool if you can clone yourself? Yeah, I would. I'd stay home and send my clone to work like I'm doing now. Sexual reproduction is much slower, but because the offspring are the genetic combination of two parents, sexual reproduction promotes genetic variety. And genetic variety is a good thing. A population with rich genetic diversity is more likely to survive a catastrophic event. Organisms that reproduce sexually produce gametes, or sex cells. A male gamete is called a sperm, and a female gamete is called an egg. Fertilization occurs when a sperm cell fuses with an egg cell and forms a zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg. If you're not sure how the sperm cell gets to the egg cell, you should probably ask your mother, or possibly your health teacher. Anyways, the fertilized egg or zygote divides and divides and divides and eventually develops into a new individual. The reproductive organ for most plants is the flower. Most flowers produce both male and female parts. The male parts produce pollen. Pollen is basically the plant equivalent of sperm cells. It's the male gamete. The egg cell is located inside of an ovary. Pollination occurs when pollen sticks to the stigma of the flower. The pollen grain grows down the style and into the ovary where fertilization occurs. The zygote develops into an embryo, which is basically a little baby plant, and it's hidden inside of a seed. When the seed falls off the plant and lands on the ground, it germinates and grows into a new adult plant. The genetic material of life is DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Wow, <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, repeat after me. Acid. That was weak. Again, acid. Acid. Say, nucleic acid. Nucleic acid. Say, ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid. Say, deoxy. Ribonucleic acid. Deoxy 
ribonucleic acid. All right, that's pretty good. So when your parents ask you what you've been learning in biology, you can impress them by saying deoxyribonucleic acid. Just be careful. You might not want to use that kind of language at the dinner table. RNA is DNA's cousin. RNA is easy. Just take off the deoxy part. Say ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid. DNA stores and transfers genetic information. All of the physical characteristics about you, how tall you are, the size of your feet, the shape of your nose, whether you're a boy or a girl, all of the information for those characteristics is stored in your DNA. You got half your DNA from your mom and half your DNA from your dad. That's why you kind of look like your mom or your dad. My dad says I look more like the mailman. Maybe someday you'll have kids and you'll pass your DNA onto them and hopefully they'll look a little bit like you. Next, all living things respond. We respond to stimuli in the environment. The environment's always changing and if an organism doesn't respond and keep up, it might not live. For example, say you're walking across the street. You hear a loud rumbling noise. You feel the ground start to shake. You smell diesel exhaust and you look over and see a big yellow object coming your way. You better respond because if you don't respond, you're gonna get run over by a bus. Or how about this? It's been a long, hard day. You sit down at the dinner table and your mom sets in front of you your favorite food and you can smell it. Okay. How are you gonna respond? All living things adapt. All species have the ability to adapt. Since Earth's climate goes through periodic long-term changes, you know, like ice age and then no ice age and then ice age and then no ice age, if species don't adapt, they'll go extinct, like the dinosaurs. You know, speaking of dinosaurs and the ice age, I don't remember much of the ice age because I was just really small at the time. But when I was in school, about 800 years ago, biology was definitely my favorite subject. I know that probably shocks most of you. Pretty hard to believe, huh? I didn't mind math too much, but me and English really didn't get along well. But biology was different. It was the only subject that really interested me. There's just something about living things that makes them different. Yeah, they're living. That's cool. Anyways, even after all these years of studying and teaching and learning about biology, it just never gets boring for me. Life is just fascinating and there's always something new to discover. My hope is that you find biology as amazing as I do. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is your introduction to biology. I hope you had just as much fun as I did because there's more to come. It's gonna be awesome. So until next time, don't get lost. I'll see you then. Have a great day.